how to start the program right now. Okay, um, once again, greetings to you all. Um, you are all welcome to this three booths um roundtable um organized for the late Professor Mesembe Ita Edet, who died on the 24th of February 2023. Um, this three booths is hosted by the Convers Conversational School of Philosophy, CSP, um, Calabar, Nigeria. And it is organized by me, Dr. Amara Esther Chimaknam, who is um, a postdoc fellow at the Center for Phenomenology in South Africa, University of Fort Hay. And um, Dr. Enyimba Maduka, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Philosophy, University of Calabar, Nigeria. I'll be moderating this event for today. And I want to say once again, it is a great um, pleasure to have you all joining us for this event. So I would like to start by calling on um, Dr. Enyi Bamaduka to give um, an opening speech on behalf of the Department of um, Philosophy, where the late Professor Mesembe was um, a lecturer and also a professor. Please, um, Dr. Madoka, you can have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amara. And uh, hello, everyone. And welcome once again to this roundtable discussion in honor of late Professor Mesembe Ita Edet. Professor Mesembe Edet was one of the finest minds in the Department of Philosophy, University of Calabar, Nigeria. He contributed in no small measure to the development of the discipline of African philosophy, the department and the University of Calabar at large. In fact, his career as an academic, which spanned over three decades before his sudden demise, had seen him produce great, great scholars and minds, great minds and scholars, as well as exciting and impactful theories that continue to influence the growth and the trajectory of African philosophy across the globe, which is one of the reasons why we are gathered here today. Dear friends, I, I believe that we are prepared to uh, ruminate over the works of this great African scholar who had mentored a lot of uh, persons. Have we ever wondered what must have motivated Mesembe to formulate his theory of Afrogeology and historicity? What is it about Nelson Mandela that had influenced Mesembe to build a theory around him? What is the relationship between conceptual Mandelanization and the language question in African philosophy? Is Mesembe correct in his numerous criticisms against Wiredu? Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that as we have this round table today, Mesembe, in the spirit of the traditional African philosopher that we know, will be listening to us as we deliberate on these questions around his theories and contributions to African philosophy. On this note, I wish every one of us a fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much. And over to you again, uh, Amara. Thank you very much, Dr. Madoka, for your um, brief introduction. You actually saved us more minutes. Um, I will call on Professor um, Jonathan Chimaknam to give a five minute remarks on, on behalf of the Conversational School of Philosophy. Please, Professor. Um, Chimak, now can you talk to us? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, and uh, your team for putting together these very wonderful uh, tributes in honor of um, great mind, uh, Professor Mesembe Itaedet. Um, I really don't know where to begin because um, my history as 
a scholar, they can not really be separated from uh, this noble mind that we are talking about today. Um, <clears throat> when I arrived at the University of Calabar to do my master's program so many years ago, I um, had the great privilege of um, being introduced to Professor Mesembe Edet. I remember that very encounter as if it were yesterday, the subtleness of his mind, this, the depth of his mind, the camaraderie of this personality. And uh, our friendship took shape from that moment. And we went on to form a great uh, bond of friendship and academic, very close academic collaboration down the years. Um, I remember when the department gave the go ahead for a few more courses to be uh, developed for uh, on African philosophy. It was two of us that the department tasked with, gave that task and we developed a few courses. <clears throat> We taught some of those courses together for years before I left the University of um, Calabar. Both of us had um, worked together and traveled together, both within and outside Nigeria for international conferences. Uh, in 2014, when the, some of us came together and said it was time to share what we had cultivated towards those who the first generation members of the Calabar school had put together. When we came together, it was both of us that really uh, argued on the floor of the departmental board that it was time to open up the Calabar school to those who are not um, at the University of Calabar, and even those who are not within the institutions in the country. We were very successful because there was a group that treasured the idea of Calabar School as something quite, um, uh, something that is the prized position of that department. And they wouldn't want, they weren't comfortable opening it up to those who are not part of the department and um, In any case, uh, it was Professor Mesembe and I that led some others to transition from Calabar School to conversational school. So many people don't know the difference between the two. That's really no difference, except that the conversational school um, provided the kind of a platform for those who are not part of the University of Calabar to be part of what the school was doing. And um, throughout his career, I came up with quite some interesting ideas in the debates in personhood in African philosophy. I remember one of his articles where he provided a very critical uh, criticism of uh, Matalino's uh, limited communitarianism and inaugurated what he called um, autonomy community. He also loved Wiredu, uh, but disagreed with Wiredu to some extent, and, and thus became one of the uh, modern critiques of Wiredu's uh, conceptual decolonization. It was he again who felt that African philosophy should learn to honor its heroes and came up with the idea of conceptual Mandelanization that has to do with agglutinating the values that Mandela stood for and projecting, uh, projecting the same in articulating philosophy. I remember uh, some years ago, should be 2015 or thereabouts, at the University of East for the Strand in South Africa, when he presented that idea to the public for the second time he had presented it at the University of Calabar, 
the CSP's uh, address. And then at that very event, I remember the whole field to the brim, and the opinions were divided between those who felt the idea was great and those who felt that it was giving too much credit to Mandela. Uh, it was the high point of his academic um, endeavors. And then when he published the essay where he, 2018, in a collection that I co-edited with Louis de Toir, where he talked about historicity, I spotted a great idea that had even eluded myself, even as an advocate of uh, uh, women position in philosophy. And so there are too many things that I can say about Ms. Um, Mbe, but I'd have to stop here to allow others to weigh in as well. So thank you very much. And um, on behalf of the Conversion School of Philosophy, uh, we say uh, it's a life well spent, even though it ended abruptly. For Professor Mesembe, it is left for us to continue to engage with the ideas that he propagated and see how we can um, enrich philosophy uh, in his memory. Thank you. Over to you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Chimapnam, for such uh, interesting opening remarks. Um, this is the way we will start this event. The two speakers will first give their lectures and then we will open the floor for discussions and contributions, comments and questions. So I will go ahead to call up the first speaker for today, um, Dr. Christiana Idika. Um, Dr. Christiana Kalis Ngozi Idika is a lecturer at the Catholic University. Mays Jamni and a visiting lecturer at the Center for Migration Studies, Nandi Azikiwe University, Oka, Nigeria. She will be engaging with um, late um, Professor Mesembe's work on her historicity. Please, um, Dr. Idika, you can have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, moderator Amara. Thank you so much for trying to bring my full name. Um, people don't always do that, but I, I always like it uh, since it creates a lot of confusion for people. So uh, thank you so much. And I'm grateful that I could uh, read it th this test. This is my first time of reading it. I'm grateful that I read it and that I will be able to talk about it today. So the, the, the title of this text is uh, Women in the His Story. So His Story of Philosophy and the Imperative for a Her Historical Perspective. I will still come back to this topic again. So in Contemporary African Philosophy, this uh, text was pub is published in a book edited by uh, Louis uh, de Tour and uh, Professor Chima Konam published in 2018. It is a text of about 10 pages, quite dense. I think uh, he condensed it. And, and because of that, he couldn't uh, give more, uh, he couldn't uh, give more, uh, maybe more argument for his position. So but we'll come to that later on. So this is how the outline is going to be like usually I, I didn't want to make any a PowerPoint presentation that takes more time than just discussing. So um, the outline will go like this. First, I will have an introduction and this introduction will have to do with what I'm just doing now. And then we'll go back to the title again, uh, where we'll raise some concerns, uh, uh, which more or less uh, establishes what is in the text. And then uh, I will raise more or less some questions before we start the text. And some of these questions is the questions you also find at the end of the text, the questions he himself raised. So, but I added a few more questions. So we'll come back to those questions probably at the end of my presentation or during discussions. 
Um, then I will go ahead to give an overview of his uh, critique of uh, not simp not only uh, African philosophy, history of philosophy, history of philosophy, but also uh, Western history of philosophy, of which uh, he, according to him, Africa inherited uh, the biases. And then uh, the final part will be, I will highlight his argument for her historical perspective, okay? So, and finally, I will then return to the questions and then probably my own reviews or my own perspective on a couple of things using the, some of the questions he raised and the ones that I added. Of course, uh, then general discussions or particular questions to me on the text or maybe on what I said. So now let's go back to the topic. Um, the use of the pronoun his and her then with a story in it. So generally, um, as he himself acknowledged that history, um, you know, is a kind of uh, a narrative, okay? A critical, he called it a critical narrative of the past events. Now, of course, we can neglect the fact that uh, the whole idea of history is being questioned, the purpose and uh, methodology, and of course, the position of the historian, historian or historian in, in this context. So it is not that the issue of history is already a given. So matters concerning it as a discipline and also its purpose and content is also questioned. So she, he acknowledged that in the text. Now, but then um, I have to look at uh, her and his as, as pronouns, regardless of the fact that history is an academic discipline. Yeah, of course, he acknowledged it later in the text. Um, in the topic, he talked about perspective, okay, her historical perspective, but he said history. So we are criticizing history, all right, or his story. But he is introducing her historical perspective. We will look at how that is problematic. Why, for me, the question will be at the end, is he talking about the woman's perspective in, in presenting the history? I mean, now, again, we repeat the history. So I'll be using narrative, okay, to avoid the complications that I am also trying to raise. So um, when he said, her historical perspective, you know, maybe in contemporary African philosophy or ancient uh, philosophy, is he concerned with the views or the narrative as presented by women or that women are also active in this, in this whole narrative? That means that um, we are not talking about men, great men, who did or who uh, okay who did a couple of things or wrote a couple of tests or discovered ideas or uh, deal dealt with concepts but also women who also did that or is he concerned with women telling the story of great men or women telling the story of great women or men telling the story of great women so we need to please hold on on to this question that i just raised now um, at the end, we will now come back to the question and see whether what did Edith really did in the text. Okay, so now that is the, the, the whole idea, the question of the title, the his story and her story, and then the whole question of historical perspective. Now, the her story is a concept or a term that originated, according to him, from Robin Morgan, um, in a test, uh, she wrote on uh, an article, Goodbye to All That, uh, which was also used by women to fight uh, sexism. So in this, uh, in the context of her uh, edit, her story is a neologism, okay, coined as maybe a word uh, to um, demonstrate or to critique uh, the conventional historiography as presented by the masculine uh, gender. So 
of course, he acknowledged the academic implication of this term. That means, as I said earlier, uh, will it necessitate changing this discipline? Because the discipline itself is gendered. History, if we follow it with his own analysis, that means history itself is a gendered concept. All right? Um, what implication would that have for academics? So then uh, her story is this narratives from a woman's perspective. Again, woman's perspective. I am also uh, concerned um, about this. So he talked about lives, experiences, deeds, contributions, voices, perceptions, expectations, representations, struggles, participation in human affairs. Uh, from the woman's perspective, had been undermined and undervalued. That means that is a, a general statement, not, not necessarily about philosophy in general and also um, African philosophy. So for him, so far, history has been the biography of great men. So his story has been a story told by men about men or told by men who weren't even there, told by men about men or about events by men. And the, the, the those who tell this story were not even there. It could be that there are women there, but these women, their perspective of this event weren't taken into consideration. Um, I don't know how many of us are Igbo's here. I will say something in Igbo that, <laughs> that is quite interesting. So, um, in this context, uh, you it's, it's a reverse thing. That means that the man is the great, the warrior, the, the 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 person in the middle of the whole story, but the woman is now the one telling the story. But it doesn't apply in this context because in this context, the man is the, the hero and also the narrator, all right? So, he also traced this concept of history, okay, um, as originating from a Greek word, historia, which means knowledge obtained by inquiry into the past. So if this is a definition of historia or history, now we can only add that this knowledge obtained by inquiry into the past is done by the masculine gender, neglecting, okay, the inquiry into the past by women or the role women played in that inquiry, inquiry that happened in the past. So the second part is where I said I will also raise some questions. So now the first thing is it wasn't clear um, his own understanding of philosophy, but in one of the pages he said that a, a philosophy is a product of critical reflection carried out in the light of pure reason. This is more or less, for me, also heavily westernized um, westernized definition. What is pure reason? Okay, so the moment we begin with that, it will still end up, you know, the reason for the neglect, not only in African philosophy, but in Western philosophy, the neglect of women. So my first question, my my, so my first question would be what he meant by pure reason. Um, in the light of pure reason. So he didn't define it, he just defined philosophy as that. So, and he talked about maybe in the context of African philosophy, that it is organized corpus of knowledge on specific African experience, including probably traditions or mm, thoughts and methods, like what is being done in um, a conversational philosophy. Now, also what makes a philosopher that is man or woman, what makes the person a philosopher? And then if we extend it, it has always occurred. I mean, I've read it also in Chima Konam's Atolo Omalo, um, who is an African philosopher, all right? So um, it's also, it is also important for when we clear that, um, or maybe it's already cleared, then we can now say who is a woman philosopher in the African context and or who is a man philosopher in African context. Um, these are background questions anyways. We don't need to answer them. Then what could be the factor underlying these, these biases? I mean, the biases that we will see in the text or 
the biases of the women are, are not fully represented in the uh, in the history of philosophy and uh, Western philosophy and the history of African philosophy. What implications is expected using the term her story in the academic discipline of his story of philosophy? How many years is the text now? I mean, the text that uh, he published, this text was published, like I said, in 2018. So he's quite very young. Okay, so not up to 10 years. But does the time of the application publication make any difference? Is it possible that if we pick up a text today that is written last year on African philosophy, that his the things he observed in the works of Wiredu or Chima Konam, that there have been changes? We need to think about that. And what is the reason for the absence of strong women's and feminist voices? So he quoted Louis de Tour who said that there, are, there is an absence of strong women. So now this word qualification, strong, is the strong referring to the thoughts, strong philosophical thoughts, or referring to the women themselves. So how will you define a strong woman who will possess a philosophical voice? Okay, so um, I, I've, I haven't read the text from Louis de Torah. Maybe she explained what she meant. I just saw the quotes uh, in Edith's text. Then the final question from my side, before I, uh, before I now go into the overview, is are there truly few women in African philosophy? Okay, so this question, you will discover it when um, I will start analyzing Edith's um, critique of some of African philosophers who wrote anthologies, compilations of African philosophy, and uh, more or less neglected um, the role of women. Okay, so the question will be, are there truly few women in African philosophy? Was this intentional? Or is it that they couldn't reach more people? So, overview. Now, let's have uh, a, a short overview of uh, his uh, presentation. So one, he said there is an absence of a comprehensive presentation of the history of Afri African philosophy, which represents both male and female epistemic standpoints. Okay, which also which accommodates the masculine and feminine perspective. That is now I will understand his perspective as meaning narrative right? Narrative. And of course, when it has to do with ideas and concepts in African philosophy, it will also include adiano, um, female voices that have dealt with such questions that has been raised in African philosophy. Now, he also emphasized that Africa is has inherited this bias from Western stereotype, where philosophy has been for a long time heavily masculinized, but we shouldn't lose the fact, that is now my own addition to his argument, that looking at Aristotle and Hegel, who now said reason, a mascul reason is masculinized and affectivity or emotion or feeling is feminine, feminized. In the same way that Africa, in the context of these um, uh, racial uh, philosophies, uh, racist philosophies uh, where Africa is feminized, okay? Now, could it be the case that Africa is also now biased or inherited this bias in the sense that um, this bifurcation fallacy of dividing the human person into emotion and reason uh, is also our uh, African philosophy operating on that uh, platform. Of course, the question of reason has been heavily criticized by Chima Konam um, in one of his work where he wrote about the journey of reason in African philosophy. But regardless, we can these things can be criticized conceptually, but in real praxis of African philosophy, it, it plays a, a, a lot of role. So um, Edith tried to emphasize that. So, and he talked about, um, um, African philosophy, you know, trying to blend it, the 
how African philosophy relates with Western philosophy in this discrimination against, uh, against women. Now, he quoted Louis de Toa, who said that um, in the Western thought that women have been rendered inaudible. Okay, now I introduced two other concepts, two terms. Inaudible, voiceless. Okay, so Louis de Toa used the word inaudible. Then I introduced the word silence and voiceless. What is the difference between these three words? First, inaudibility means when you say that somebody is inaudible, it means that the person is already talking, but the person is not being heard. Nobody is hearing the person. So you said to, you said to the person, please, can you be audible enough? All right. So here, I believe that his argument is that women's voice are not the circumstances, situations, whatever those situations, for some reasons um, that he didn't, uh, I have not read the tour, like I said, but for some reasons, the women's voice, even though they are speaking, that means they have done some work in philosophy, yet they are inaudible. Inaudibility doesn't necessarily mean only one individual, the woman, but the collective voice of women in African philosophy. Now, I use the word voiceless, okay, which can also apply. Voiceless means taking away the voice, all right? So the voice is not heard at all. They are not heard. And, and you will see those things when you think of some ideas in African philosophy where um, uh, women, African women um, have done a lot of work, but it is not being acknowledged. So it is here being silenced and the voice taken away. So it is not just being inaudible. It's not just being rendered inaudible. However, in some cases, it is also rendered or the voice of um, women in African philosophy is also, their voice is rendered voiceless or they are rendered silent. And then men in Western thought, according to Edith, is the center, okay? The center of thought. The same thing is applicable in African philosophy. Once on the platform, CSP platform, I read somebody said that issues about gender, issues about gender here, women should be excluded, should be added to gender studies, not into philosophy. Okay, so, and that now brings me to the question of the mindset. And of course, you can only understand that if we refer to Chima Konam's cognitive condition in his theory of super alternism. So cognitive condition is not only, cannot only be used to define the superiority, men the superior mentality of the Western uh, thinkers, but also African thinkers, male or the masculine African thinkers are also cognitively shaped. Uh, you know, they are also affected with this cognitive condition. So I, I think I could use the cognitive condition to explain um, what Edith is trying to portray in this test and what I read from CSP um, context where we are discussing about uh, women and philosophy and somebody said this thing should be discussed within gender studies. So forgetting that it, this is an anthropological question. So, and, and because it is anthropological, it is fundamental, it is metaphysical, it is ontological, and so it is philosophical. So the question of what it means to be a woman, the question of equality of women, the question of production of knowledge, these are all philosophical questions. So whether we are talking about it within the context of gender differences, it must, it, it must be fundamentally, critically, analytically evaluated in the in the light of thought. Okay, so now he further says that the history of the individual philosophers whose thought, I mean, he quoted Adeshina, Adeshina Afolayan, um, who said that uh, uh, history of Western philosophy is a history of individual philosophers whose thoughts constitutes its framework and are considered as traditional texts and classics. The same we'll notice also in African philosophy. When we tell some of these, whether it is ethno philosophy or whether uh, sage philosophy, where, even if we trace it back to um, 
philosophies of uh, uh, Senho or all those, when we still go back, you will see that these texts, we might call them classics in ethno philosophy or sage philosophy or what might be called uh, within the uh, history of philosophy according to uh, Chimakona, which for me is the best I have read so far. Yet women's voices, women uh, who did some poly political things that needs uh, that that should come under philosophy, we are not even included. And these texts are called classics and texts and traditional texts. You know, so um, it is not just Western philosophy that is um, bedeviled with this problem, but also African philosophy. And I I think I agree with Edith on that. So, and he says, absence of women in Western history of philosophy makes it lack scientific integrity and essential authenticity. So this is where I also raise some, my eyebrow on what uh, scientificity or uh, uh, authenticity, whether it is the problem of scientificity or authenticity. So people can write, I can write a text without including, uh, quoting Chima Konam or without quoting Loki or without quoting Negedu. Does that make my work inauthentic or does that make my work um, lack scientificity? So um, for me, I still have a, a little bit, uh, maybe he has more to say on that anyways. Of course, this is not exclusive problem of African and Western philosophy. It is also um, a problem in Oriental philosophy, Asian philosophy, so he said. The question is whether these are intentional gender blindness, for him, it, it is intentional. And that is the reason he's talking about her historical or her story of um, African philosophy. So, and he said the absence of women's voice in African philosophy is a historicide, okay? Historicide, that is a purposeful killing of women's perspective of the narrative of history, but he used women's perspective of his history. That means women telling the story of the man. So if he's going to change her story, then we need to also change his story. So it could be that we cannot say her story side will be a purposeful, a purposeful killing of the woman's perspective of the narrative or the inquiry into the past. So now he, he now got to uh, his critique of contemporary philosophy, where he focused on the, the, the author Ogu Jiofo, um, who now made mention of Teofili Obenga, Bilolo, Claudia Zomna, Oswagu, Omerebe, and so on and so forth. He mentioned their works. No matter how detailed he was, he ignored and excluded the thoughts of women. Again, he took up Barry Harlan, a short history of Afri African philosophy. And in this short history, only one woman who is a sociologist, Oye Ronke, Oye Wumi, was mentioned. Then the thought of the work of Sophie Oluwolo could be found in the bibliography. That means in the references without this work discussed in the main text. He took up Pasiweredu's Black Work Companion uh, to African Philosophy, published in 1997. So, and he said in the part that deals with history of African philosophy, 17 articles, all authored by men. Another part of that companion, an anthology of 47 articles covering, including the history of African philosophy, covered politics, ethics, aesthetics, uh, philosophy of religion, logic, epistemology, metaphysics, methodology. Only one woman was mentioned. Only one woman's made a contribution, Nkiru Nzebu, who contributed to essays. And one of her contribution, feminism, and Africa, impact on and limits of the metaphysics of gender is in part seven. And this part seven was devoted to spatial topics. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't qualify 
to be in ontology, in aesthetics, in metaphysics, sorry, it doesn't qualify to be in epistemology. It doesn't qualify in methodology. It qualifies as a special topic. What um, is special about it? Sorry to cut in. You have two minutes more, please. Thank okay. you. I'm already finishing. So then uh, you have um, Emmanuel Chukwudieze, African philosophy published in 1998. A total of 51 articles, only uh, five women contributed. In the case of Chima Konam's History of African Philosophy, found in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy dating between 1920 to 2014, and I want to believe that the entry was made between 2014 and 2015. He covered systematic areas, despite the structure, the comprehensiveness of that work. Edith said that Chima Kona was guilty of her story side. So in that 33 page, Jennifer Lisa, only two were mentioned, Jennifer Lisa and Sophie Oluwole. The question is, so out of 89 references and future reading, only these three, only these two people were made reference to. The question is whether uh, Chima Konam has a criteria of his choice of references and choice of women authors. Since he is here, he might be able to uh, give a response to that. And finally, Edith raised some questions that will be part of the questions that I raised earlier. What are the basic questions that engage contemporary African philosophy and how have women and feminists responded to these questions? Why are their views and voices? Why are their views and voices and thoughts on the mind? Why is it hard for their views to be acknowledged within the African philosophical canons? Is the marginalization of Africa, Africa for women in African philosophy um, conscious, intentional, and systemic? What consequences for the future of Africa, African philosophy, and knowledge production? And what, what are the consequences of neglecting women's voices on this? Now, he, he argued that including the voice of women um, will uh, create intellectual authenticity, uh, create some for holistic epistemological edifice, enrichment of the content of African philosophy, um, ideas of men, that is, uh, he talked about um, how exclusive ideas of men impacts on true and complete knowledge in African philosophy. An important thing that we need to note is the role of Anka Granes, okay? Anta, Anka Granes works on African philosophy, but is she an African philosopher? Okay, so because Edith criticized that her voice was not um, in any way acknowledged. I will also raise uh, persons like Francisca Dubgen, who also works on African philosophy, although from the Maghreb region. Is she an African philosopher, if a, a, a woman African philosopher? Um, while we are on that, we also he talked about, specifically about Sophie Oluwole, I added Pauline Abel to the, uh, to the list. Most of these people's words and works have been neglected in the comprehensive articulation of African philosophy, not just in terms of its history, but in terms of development of ideas and concepts in African philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your insightful lecture and thank you for those thoughts provoking questions. Thank you very much. Um, I will go ahead and call the second speaker, who is um, Dr. Loki Obonaya. Dr. Uchenna Obonaya is a postdoc at the African Center for Epistemology and Philosophy of Science, Faculty of Humanities, University of Johannesburg. He, he co-authored a book titled African Metaphysics, Epistemology, and a New Logic, A Decolonial Approach to Philosophy, published by Springer in 2021. Dr. Lucky, please talk to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's really an honor uh, to be invited to, to discuss uh, the thoughts of uh, one of my teachers and and mentors. Um, I've been saddled with the responsibility to, to discuss uh, 
Mesembe added a conceptual Mandelanization, uh, a thought he has articulated in, a, in a, the book edited by Jonathan Chimakonam titled The Atulo Malo, Some Unanswered Questions in African, in Contemporary African Philosophy, published uh, in 2015. Um, this uh, chapter, uh, which I'm going to focus on, uh, it's centered on uh, two issues. One, uh, African social political philosophy and the question of language in African philosophy. Uh, these are two issues that one would think are not related, but for me, I see these two issues as related given the way uh, Mesembe Edet uh, articulated the two concepts and linked it and linked them up into his, uh, his concept of conceptual uh, mandalization. And we should note that uh, his idea of conceptual mandalization is a pointer to the fact that African philosophy can be done in such a way that we can look at an African person as a model for philosophizing and addressing African existential problems. So in, 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 in this presentation, I'm going to look at the background to conceptual mandalization, and then I will do an analysis of conceptual mandalization, and I'll, then I'll raise, I'll raise some criticism uh, against uh, edits, uh, conceptual uh, mandalization. Let me begin with uh, the background to edit uh, conceptual mandalization. Uh, like I earlier said, uh, uh, that the, 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 the paper focuses on uh, two things, two themes, uh, African uh, social political philosophy and the question of language in African philosophy. Uh, Mesembe tilt much more towards uh, African social political philosophy and therefore uh, holds that uh, his idea of uh, conceptual mandalization is, uh, is rooted in the con one of the uh, social political uh, themes in African philosophy, and that has to do with uh, decolonization. And we all know that uh, Africans, uh, Africa as a continent was colonized, and that this brought about colonization, wherein Africans were made to, to devalue what is theirs, uh, and then they began to think as what is coming from the colonizers as superior. And this is what Edith called colonial mentality. This colonial mentality makes Africans to start mimicking the colonizers and their ways. So he, he calls this, uh, that, that, that this African colonizers need to be decolonized and he calls it African decolonization, which is an anti antithesis uh, to European colonization in, in Africa. Uh, we should also note that uh, Edith is not the first person to have uh, addressed this issue. He, he, for him, some African philosophers have have been involved in, in, in trying to address the, the question of colonization in Africa. And he calls these people uh, decolonial, decolonial thinkers. Uh, some of them include uh, Kwame Nkrumah, and his thought is found in his, uh, in his uh, theory known as uh, conscientism. Also, you can see it in, his, in, a, in a, uh, Leopold Senghor's uh, thought uh, titled Negritude. You can also see it in the thought of Nyerere and uh, Kenneth Kauda's uh, uh, African socialism. And what is interesting about what Mesembe has uh, brought out in that, uh, uh, in that particular chapter is that he, he dwelt a bit on uh, the thought of uh, Molifi Asante, especially his idea of uh, Afrocentricity. And for him, uh, this thought really brings out an idea of a uh, decolonial thinking that we need to pay attention to. And he also talked about the thought of a quasi redu, especially his concept of conceptual articulation. I think this is really the cross of his work. He really dwelled on this to, to articulate his, uh, his uh, conceptual mandalization. So I, I'm going to spend more time to analyze his idea that he has put forward as uh, a reaction to, to, to Weredu's thought. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to point to the fact that uh, for Edit, uh, uh, Asante's uh, Afrocentricity uh, comes uh, came okay, was articulated as a result of the idea and belief that uh, Africa and Africans uh, 
have been dislocated uh, historically, economically, socially, politically, uh, and philosophically. And therefore, he called for the, uh, for the relocating of African Africans historically, economically, socially, politically, and philosophically. And for him, it can be done if Africans are brought back to the African culture. So they, so they should be reintroduced to the African culture. That it is in this way that uh, Africans can really have African thoughts that are distinctly African and uh, cannot be said to be Western in orientation or propagating or producing or articulating a Western colonial thought. Uh, so uh, for Edith, he, he goes on to say that uh, even Kwasi Uredu follows this line of thought, but given that he is a philosopher, he dwelt much more on the philosophical dimension. And for him, this is found in his conceptual decolonization. But the interesting thing is that Edith did not just jump into uh, discussing uh, Uredu's conceptual uh, decolonization. He started somewhere. Uh, for him, that there is a need, following a Asante, there's a need to relocate Africa back, Africa and Africans back to African culture. But for him, he is just thinking, is what I do right in this? And he said, no, for what I do, there, there's a way forward that we should not just accept African culture and bring the Africans back to it. That there's a need to interrogate and reconstruct African culture when necessary, and therefore, uh, what they do came up with a uh, cultural reconstructionism. And this idea of cultural reconstruction, reconstructionism uh, is a philosophical methodology that holds that uh, there's a need for Africans, our African philosophers, to, to critically and uh, uh, reconstructively analyze African oral traditions uh, and also explore the modern literature in such a way that we can achieve a sentence that is relevant for contemporary African philosophy. Hence, uh, concept, uh, cultural uh, reconstructionism points to the fact that African philosophy should be a critique of African uh, culture. Uh, the essence of this is to see that uh, African philosophy overcomes some of the three evils that bedevils the society. And what are these three evils? Uh, he talked about anachronism, he talked about uh, authoritarianism, he talks about uh, supernaturalism. And he said that there's a need for African uh, uh, philosophers to articulate African philosophy so that it does not really reflect this trait. But for him, according to Edith, uh, uh, what he do sees that uh, supernaturalism is not a problem in Africa, but that anachronism and authoritarianism are the basic problem that must be avoided, and that African philosophy should avoid that as much as possible. So in, in, in a nutshell, what uh, uh, Mesembe is saying about the uh, Kwasi Uredu's conceptual, uh, I mean, uh, cultural reconstructionism is that it is a theory that gives African philosophy the opportunity to interrogate African culture in such a way that African culture can but Mr. Bear fall back to reflect. Is it really the path to doing philosophy? Has really do said it all in his cultural reconstructionism? For him, no. That even what he do himself does not see it as the, 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 the final or the final path to African philosophizing. And this is where he, he dived into uh, the language question in African philosophy by saying that uh, where they do uh, proposes conceptual decolonization as the approach recommended for inquiry in African philosophy to make up for the lack in cultural reconstructionism. And the question is, what is conceptual decolonization all about? What is it all about? How does it fill the gap in cultural reconstructionalism as it relates to the question of language in African philosophy? Um, there is this uh, long debate I'm not going to dabble into on uh, the most appropriate language uh, with which we should uh, 
articulate or do African philosophy. But there are two broad schools of thought, uh, the universalist school of thought and, and, and the particular school of thought. Why the universalist school of thought seems to give the idea that African philosophy can be done in a more universal language, which is normally a foreign language and especially a colonial language like the English language, uh, uh, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and so on. And you see uh, African philosophers such as uh, Bell, uh, A. G. A. Bello uh, uh, pushing forward such an idea. Then there's also the particularists. And I think these are the people who Mesembe a bit pointed to. And, and for them, they, they believe that African philosophy, for it to be called African philosophy proper, it should concern itself with addressing African problems and, uh, and philosophizing using an indigenous African language. Uh, for what I do, I think he, 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 he doesn't agree with this, according to Edith, and therefore he went on to, uh, to put forward his conceptual decolonization. Uh, then what is conceptual decolonization? There are, uh, it, it's an idea that uh, it's, a, it's, a method, it's a philosophical methodology that gives us the impression that African philosophy can be done in a foreign language, but that, uh, uh, that, that, that key philosophical concepts should uh, be replaced in, 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 with an indigenous word or with indigenous words. Uh, uh, so uh, according to Edith, uh, we do points to, 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 to two sides of conceptual uh, marginalization, and this has to do with the negative and the positive sides. And for him, the, the, the negative side is concerned with avoiding and overcoming the superimposition and uncritical assimilation of foreign philosophical categories in our African thought system. And therefore, for him, we need to you know, avoid these uh, Western categories influencing our African philosophizing. And on the positive side, he, he said that, okay, there's a need also to, to go back to our African language and pick up concept. And he said, but this concept cannot just be picked up uh, like that. We need to examine them and then harvest them, then employ them as conceptual schemes in philosophizing. So this concept will have to replace key philosophical concept. And he went on to say that we do the, uh, uh, we do pro uh, uh, propose some uh, concepts that need to be decolonized and Mesembe added Africanized uh, when we are doing African philosophy. Some of these concepts include uh, the concept of uh, being, the concept of belief, uh, the concept of chance, the concept of cause, entity, uh, effect, ego, fact, objectivity, subjectivity, quality, reality, religion, substance, truth, and so on and so forth. But the bottom line is that for Edith, what they do holds an idea in his conceptual uh, uh, decolonization that points to the fact that uh, African philosophy, uh, that it, it should involve a analysis, a criticism, a, 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 uh, it should also be scientific and comparative. So for you to get involved in, compa in a conceptual decolonization, you must be analytical, you must be critical, scientific, and comparative in your approach. And Edith goes on to state the reasons, the reasons for what it does conceptual uh, uh, decolonization. And one of it is that uh, he said that it's, it's a means of avoiding a, a uncritical assimilation of foreign ideas or foreign concepts or foreign conceptual skin into African philosophizing. Another, another reason is that uh, conceptual decolonization will help African philosophers to understand what really informs African culture, the intellectual foundation of African culture, to help us understand, to bring it out and make us understand it better before we employ this philosophical concept or philosophical culture or ideas to articulate African African philosophy. He also said that uh, conceptual declaration will help Africans overcome this idea of peculiarities in African philosophy. We can talk about Igbo philosophy, Akan philosophy, Zulu philosophy, Yoruba philosophy, Hausa philosophy, and so on and so forth. That it would rather give it a universal disposition. It will make it more universal than particular. And, and, and these are the reasons, I think, uh, for Edith, uh, that uh, we really do have to like uh, articulate his conceptual uh, 
uh, decolonization. Edith also went on to say that uh, he is not satisfied with this idea of conceptual decolonization. So he raised some criticisms uh, against uh, what reduced conceptual decolonization. One of it is that he says that uh, conceptual decolonization does not really address uh, issues that borders Africa and Africans, but rather it is concerned with concepts, philosophical concepts. Uh, so for him, African philosophy should transcend the level of dealing with concepts and go down to doing a, uh, to addressing African existential problems. Uh, he went on to say that it is not as universal. It does not really bring African philosophy to being as universal as a what do has proposed that it should be. Uh, then the, the thought is that uh, conceptual decolonization gives an idea that a uh, African philosophy uh, must be considered as comparative philosophy. Because if it's not comparative philosophy, then it's not African philosophy because you place Western philosophy side by side uh, with African philosophy when you are trying to do African philosophy. And he says that if that is the case, then it will face the problems of a uh, of uh, the, the problem faced by uh, comparative uh, philosophy. And this problem include uh, descriptive chauvinism, normative chauvinism, uh, normative, chauvinism uh, normative skepticism, the problem of incommensurability, the problem of perennial, perennialism. And also he talked about another problem outside uh, the problem that uh, comparative philosophy is faced with as a problem of African philosophy, if done using uh, conceptual decolonization, he talk about ethnocentric reduction and imposition. He he borrowed this idea from innocent uh, as Susan. My concern has to do with the last, and that is what will take us to his idea or uh, his concept of a conceptual modernization, and that is it has to do with his uh, his uh, criticism against conceptual uh, decolonization. Uh, for him, I'm sorry, uh, sorry to cut in. Please, um, can you round off in you now in next three minutes? Please? Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. So for him, he said that conceptual decolonization is not problem focused and problem solving approach to doing African philosophy. It is on this note that he articulated his conceptual modernization as a problem focused and problem solving approach to African philosophy. The question now is, what is conceptual modernization? What is conceptual modernization? For Edith, conceptual modernization, I will quote him directly, involves the application of the systematic, logical, critical and analytic tools of thought of the African philosopher in reflection on the total experience of the African in the Africa we know, in shaping the Africa of the future, in the spirit of the legacies of Nelson Mandela, end of course. There are some deductions that can be made from uh, this assertion. One is that conceptual modernization employs philosophical tools such as analysis, criticality, logicality, and systematicity. The implication of this is that conceptual modernization is philosophical, and that's why it can pass as African philosophy. Uh, number two is that uh, conceptual modernization is an approach to African philosophy that should be employed by African philosophers. So when you're doing it, it's solely African philosophers that should employ this method. So it is much more restrictive. That's one of the criticisms that can be raised against conceptual modernization. It's more restrictive. But the, the, the interesting thing is that it gives the picture that uh, conceptual legislation is African philosophy, and that the, the result, I mean, it's it, it done by an African philosopher, and the resultant philosophy is African philosophy. Uh, and the number three deduction is that uh, conceptual legislation is concerned with the total African experience in the Africa we know. Two things also can be drawn from this. It gives the impression 
that when we are doing African philosophy, we are reflecting on the African experience. This is in line with Chukokulong's thought, Chukokulong's thought, which, which says that the African philosophy deals with the African experience, the past, present, and the future uh, 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 experience of the African in the African place. Uh, also, the other point is that if we're doing African philosophy, then it must be concerned with the problems of contemporary Africa. So that's why he talk about the Africa we know, the Africa we know. Uh, the, 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 the fourth point to note is that conceptual modernization advocates a historical African figure, Nelson Mandela, as a possible solution to African problems. I would say if you're doing African philosophy, you should center it around the person of Nelson Mandela, not just his person, his ideas, his thoughts, uh, 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 his values and lifestyle. So he becomes an ideal human for us to philosophize on. Uh, with this, I, I would like to, to say that uh, the central idea in conceptual modernization is that contemporary African philosophizing should revolve around the personage of Nelson Mandela and his lived out values and qualities, which are humanistic, which are oriented towards taking care of the welfare of the human person. Uh, if, uh, 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 we should also note, I will just bring this up and then raise my criticism within the next uh, uh, five minutes and say uh, goodbye to it. We need to note that there are three principles or rules uh, of conceptual modernization. And one of it is, one of the first principle is that you must ask what Nelson Mandela would do. Number two, you must ask, what did Nelson Mandela say? Then number three, you must interrogate the concept in the context of what Mandela would have done or what he said. Um, the summary of this is that for him, when you are doing African philosophy or we are trying to address any African issue, we must address these issues using the personage and the values that are encapsulated in the person of Nelson Mandela. For him, African, Africa as a continent is faced with a lot of problems, problems of leadership, governance, and when we are addressing these issues, we should focus much more on using the thoughts, the values of Mandela to address this issue. Now, I'll move over to some of the criticism or questions I have that bothered my mind while uh, reflecting on the work. One of it is, uh, must African philosophy be restricted to a person? and or his or her values. Most African philosophy be restricted to a person and or his or her values. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, uh, I have raised this criticism in my reaction to his, to his work. Uh, there, there I argued that uh, uh, Mandela might be an ideal person, yes, but there are some flaws that might be found uh, in his life and thoughts that we might not accept. I think Mesembe will go around it by saying that, yeah, if you involve uh, criticality, uh, logicality, and uh, strategy to study Mandela's thought, you can sieve out those important values and use them. Uh, so in that way, he can wriggle his way out if he was to be alive. Uh, the next question has to do with, uh, I, I said I did a, a profound philosophical methodology to doing African for that is distinct from uh, Mensen, I mean, from uh, where they do say conceptual decolonization. And there are two ways to, to, the, to, the, to the question. One would be yes. And the yes is because uh, he emphasized that African culture should be done in the light of the personage and values of Nelson Mandela. And, 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 and the second could be no. And the no is a uh, premise on the fact that uh, he was saying that where, uh, where it do emphasis in, is, is on uh, the, the decolonization of, uh, of concept rather than addressing African, African problems. 
But if you look at his thought, Edith's thought properly, you see that he also ended up thinking about decolonizing, decolonizing concepts because he's talking about the concept of leadership, poverty, uh, illiteracy, all these are concepts. So it's a two-way thing. Why he's saying, yeah, we dwell on a person, we use his thought, we use his ideas, we use his uh, ideals, we use, uh, use his value to address this existential problem. But this existential problem are also concepts that he has listed. So there's no how you can talk about conceptual modernization without talking about the uh, conceptual decolonization. Uh, the third issue is in the question of what makes conceptual modernization a methodological theory in African philosophy. So is it the person Mandela? Is it because he's an African that we can say, okay, when we use his thought, his, uh, his ideas, his values to articulate African philosophy, then we are doing African philosophy? Is it the issues that we are addressing? Or is it the values that is encapsulated in the person of Nelson Mandela? And then the, the, the fifth, the fourth question is, what kind of values do Mandela encapsulate? Are they purely African values? Or did Mandela have some external influence outside the African cultural values? Even Mandela himself, an edit in his uh, work uh, titled Afro, uh, Afro Afrosiology, conceptual modernization, and the conversational order in the new era of African philosophy uh, agrees to that, that uh, Mandela is not solely influenced by African cultural values, that he was influenced by the Christian Bible and Islamic teaching. So if this is the case, then the values are not purely African values. Rather, I say that they are uh, afro christo islamic values, and the resultant philosophy cannot be said to be purely African philosophy or African social political philosophy. Rather, conceptual translation can be termed afro christo islamic philosophy. As a way of concluding, I would like to say that my criticism might have been raised, but this does not imply that uh, uh, conceptual articulation is not a viable uh, methodology to do in African philosophy. Therefore, I invite all of us to do African philosophy and more specifically, African social political philosophy using a dead conceptual mandalization. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lucky, for your interesting talk. And uh, thank you also for raising some of these um, interesting issues. Um, the floor is now open for discussions. If you have a contribution to make, a comment, um, a question, even if you want to provide answers to the questions that have been raised already, please kindly raise your hand up. I will call you to ask your questions or make your contributions. Thank you. Please, do we have anyone that wants to say anything? This is a very um, important um, lectures, two important lectures that we had today in honor of um, Professor Edet. If you want to contribute, if you want to comment, if you want to ask questions, you are free to do so. Okay, why we are waiting for someone to articulate his or her question. Um, actually, Dr. Christie, when you were um when you were talking, I, I was thinking about so many things, especially with the issue of um her historicity. I think I agree with you with some of the issues you raised. When we talk about her historicity, should history or um I'm making that mistake, I'm sorry, should the narrative or, or, or um, of the past or uh, as it pertains to philosophy, should we as women write about the past from our own perspective, excluding the male, or should we write about the past, including both the male and the female? In what aspects actually are we going to go about this her historicity? 
it, it got me thinking because in the paper it wasn't really um explained. Okay, I can see a hand up here. Um, Negedu, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Negedu, are you here? Are you still here with us? Or have you gone to worship the ancestors? Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I was looking for a less uh, noisy place to ask my questions. So I'll be running around trying to find the location. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, it's a quick one. Uh, thanks, Christian uh, Uchena. But uh, I, I have uh, two issues, one for Uchena and one for Christy. Uh, for, for, Uch for, for Christy, um, in, in your classification of uh, who an African philosopher is, um, I, I know you mentioned, for instance, in Chima Konam's works and some other philosophers, you know, that may have, you know, uh, limited the number of female African philosophers included in their works. And of course, I recall you mentioned somebody like Anke Granes, and you, you, you raise an issue whether she even classifies to be called an African philosopher. So I, I don't know. Uh, uh, can we have an idea what's your understanding of who an African philosopher should be? Uh, should it be someone who is strictly, you know, from the African continent or who is high melanated? I, I, I need that distinction before I, I know if there are other issues from, from them. Then uh, for Uchena, I, I know you talk about the uh, Conceptual Mandelanization, and you 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 raised an issue about uh, Metembe Edet being influenced by by Chris. Is it Metembe? No. By uh, you you raised an issue of Nelson Mandela being influenced by by Christian and Islamic groups, if I got you correctly. And it was from that background that. Mesembe Edek was also writing from. Now, does the fact that Nelson Mandela was influenced by Christian and Islamic groups, you know, take away, you know, the Africanness of the philosophy from Mesembe Edek? Just by mere influence of his work, does, does it take away, you know, does it take away that? Because if I'm asking this question, because when we want to take a look at uh, other, you know, philosophers. You know, other philosophers we, we refer to as African philosophers. Yeah, and I will also want to include even the works of, uh, the, the work of Chim, uh, Jonathan Chimakona. You see, uh, you cannot deny that Western influence in their works. So would you take away the Africanness of, the philosophy of Nesende Edesh because of that influence. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Negudu, for your questions. Uh, please, who is Can going for us? Is it Dr. Lucky or Dr. Christie? Okay, okay, let me start. Let me go first. Okay. Uh, uh, and please, I, I would like to answer the two questions, even, even though I'm not the one who presented on the first. Uh, there, there, are, there are many criteria so defining who an African philosopher is and what uh, an African philosophy is. Uh, Chima Konam has wrestled with this issue. I think I've also reacted to that issue by critiquing uh, Chima Konam's view. Uh, there, are, there are those who hold to the opinion that it must be somebody of African origin. Uh, that's the, the, the uh, position of uh, Pauline Hotunji. But then there are those who hold to the idea that it must address African existential issue, what is concerned with African issues. So the person who is writing, if he's vast in African issue, then uh, that is African philosophy, and that person is an African uh, philosopher. There, there is the idea that the person uh, also should be doing, uh, driving his or her, uh, philosophy from African culture, the position of a uh, 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 Sophie Oluwole, the position of uh, Uduma, the position of uh, uh, Mwala, and so on and so forth. And then Chima Konam holds that the person must, uh, he, earlier Chima Konam would say that the person 
was do African philosophy using African background logic. Then uh, Ogbonaya came up with his uh, idea that uh, following where they do and others that it must, uh, the, pe the person or the philosopher must be do, do African philosophy using African background ontology. And that informed Chimakona bringing up a new idea that it must involve both African uh, uh, logic and African uh, ontology uh, as the tools with which the person operates and do African philosophy. So there are, there are many factors. So we are not tying ourselves to any other factors. So it's open. So that's why the Westerners can also be classed as African philosophers. So if the toy is doing African philosophy based on any of these criteria, then uh, her thought can pass as African philosophy. She can be called an African philosopher. If Anke Granice is doing the same thing, uh, if others who are non-Africans are engaged in doing African philosophy using any of these criteria, we can also say that they are African philosophers and their thoughts can pass as African philosophy. Uh, uh, going to my own uh, section, where you talk about uh, my criticism of uh, edit, uh, conceptual mandalization uh, based on the fact that Mandela was influenced by uh, Islamic and uh, Christian uh, ideology, uh, if it really takes away the Africanness of uh, the philosophy so produced. Uh, for me, I didn't say it takes it away, but I say it cannot be, it cannot be termed pure African philosophy. Uh, so that's why I say it's Afro, it's a uh, crystal Islamic philosophy. So it's still African philosophy. Uh, you can better understand it when you look at uh, Northern Africa that is predominantly Islamic. Can you, can you class their philosophy as uh, African philosophy? The highest you can go is you can say that it is Afro-Islamic philosophy or Afro-Arabic philosophy. Thank you. Thank you for your response. Um, Dr. Chrissy, do you want to say something? Please, let's keep our responses brief and the comments also brief so that we can accommodate as many questions as possible. Thank you. Yes. So um, I will just uh, raise my own reaction even to what uh, Abuna also responded. You know, um, I will more or less uh, study in the Western world even though I'm doing German philosophy, I'm not called a German philosopher. Um, I, I, I've, I've presented works that non, no German, I mean, I mean, an average person at my, at my research age, you know, to talk about Kant and, and Hegel, some of their um, classic authors, you know, uh, make presentation. Yet I am not, I'm not, rather they can call me a Western trend African, philosopher, something like that. So um, so I practically had to, maybe we can combine words, okay, that uh, Western are doing African philosophy or that, uh, like you said, it is quite open, but I'm also critical about, about that. I have encountered Ancres and we have been in, a, in one room and believe you me, um, coming from an Af African uh, epistemological context, responding to what she was saying about what she developed as an African thought was for me so biased, all right? So um, we cannot just put those things um, out of the way just because the person is engaging with the ideas or the person is engaging with uh, African existential ideas. For me, the central point will be methodological. It will be a question of methodological and th that defines it. And that brings me to the question of uh, uh, women in African philosophy, which is what the question is all about. It's not just about who is a philosopher. Once we define who is a philosopher within African philosophical context, then we need to ask what makes a woman in an African context an African philosopher. That means the person has that competence to deal not, not only with the ideas, but also methodologically. The person must have that logic. Logic, not just logic that you borrow because logic is something that is shaped, okay? So it is it is the thinking, the, the pattern of thought is shaped. It's culturally shaped. It is contextually shaped. So that for somebody to use another methodology um, to do an analysis of a situation, you will see the lapses because the person also needs to be contextually shaped in that logic. So for me, what is what should be the main um, what we look out for who an African philosopher is, is the methodological approach uh, to that. And Amara, 
your remark on her historicity. Um, let me just take you, I'm taking a lot of time, but you think of menopause, okay? You think of uh, menstruation, you think of female, you think of um, woman, okay? So all these things, all these concepts contain, have in it, um, all the male terms that you can imagine. And that is what uh, um, Mother Pauline called the androcentric word the androcentric word that we cannot escape. So where should we lay the emphasis? On the content, like women's voice being heard, not just telling their own story, but also telling the story of men. But this story being held authentic, this story also not being evaluated because it's a woman that is telling it, all right? So that, that, that's the problem. Um, this concept is going to be very, very problematic in academics, in everyday life and in every use of the word, his story or her story. Thank you so much for your responses. Um, Ume Zureke, please unmute yourself and ask your question very brief, please. Thank you. Is Ume Zureke here with us? Okay, um, while we are waiting for Ms. Rike, um, Maduka, please unmute yourself and make your contribution. Thank you. Yes, I'm okay, ready, please. I'm ready, please. Please, I'm ready. All right, go on, go on, I'm Ms. Rike. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, please, please, sorry, you. in this country, Nigeria, many things are very difficult, including network. Please, sorry, I just logged in. I thank God I'm here. Uh, actually, I went through Mesembe's work, the issue of uh, conceptual decolonization by Weredu, and then his response uh, using the uh, mentalization, the concept he coined as mentalization. And I think it's Dr. Loki who handled that particular part. Where I have a serious issue over this whole thing, and the issue I have is the fact that we shouldn't, uh, women should not be crying as if they are not being carried along uh, intellectually. I'm sorry, there could be an epistemic injustice, as Tim Economy has maybe mentioned, and all kinds of many people, scholars, who have talked about uh, epistemic injustice and the rest of them. But then, I, I believe the problem the women are having, uh, you know, in, you know, a kind of maintaining their intellectual place in the globe, uh, is the fact that uh, that this that what I call not what I call but that's that's what we call uh, this limitation uh, what we call not discrimination when you talk about gender for instance people have been talking about gender discrimination I don't believe in that I see that gender limitation you know sometimes when we are limited we feel that probably we are not being given the right place to perform. Someone like uh, Press B of USC, Detroit, USC, USA, someone like uh, uh, Helen Lua, and the rest of them. I believe if you do well, personally, I don't think you will That's not good. be cited because you're women. I believe, as we are discussing about this, uh, lo and behold, Ms. Embe, who's supposed to have defended this, is not a lie. But then, be that as me, we must understand that we should not be talking about these issues. Uh, discrimination here and there. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ms. Zurique. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. There is no more time. Thank you. Can I ask my question now? Let me ask my question. Let's let's question. Okay, ask your question very brief, please. Uh, please, look, uh, you are the one who is representing Ms. Zembe. The his idea of conceptual decolonization and that that's where it is conceptual decolonization and that of this mentalization. How do we, you know, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, how do we... Differentiate, differentiate the both. Thank you very much, um, okay. Ms. Rike. Thank you so much. Lucky, please, Dr. Lucky, please, you can... Okay, thank you, Dr. Ms. Rike, for your question. Uh, I, I, I tried to make the distinction when I when I said that uh, in 
when they do conceptual uh, decolonization, the emphasis is on decolonizing and, and Africanizing key philosophical concepts. And how do we go about that? First, we need to take we need to do African philosophy using uh, a foreign colonial language, uh, but that the key philosophical concepts should be replaced with African words. While in a conceptual uh, modernization, my second argument is that uh, while doing African philosophy, we need to address African existential problems that are uh, confronting Africa today by trying to look at the values and personage of the person of Nelson Mandela. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Loki. Um, Dr. Madoka, please unmute yourself and ask your question or make your contribution. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Amara. And I want to thank the two speakers for uh, accepting the invitation and also critically going through the works and making uh, critical remarks raising up a fundamental questions. I have just two questions. Number one, to Christy, um, MSMB raised a very important problem in African philosophy, history of African philosophy, which is uh, what you call feminine problem in philosophy. You took time to analyze them very beautifully. Uh, but he also drew, drew attention to the fact that there is a need to address this problem. And I think I agree with him. But the only thing that I seem to be worried about is that he didn't make any suggestion towards how it could be addressed. I don't know whether I read him well. Maybe he did. If he did, you could let us know. If he didn't, what do you think should be how we could go about solving this problem? That's for you. Then for um, uh, uh, Lucky, the question is still almost the same. He, in his conceptual Mandelanization, he linked it to the problem of... Uh, uh, pro language problem in African philosophy made a lot of criticisms against uh, Wiredu, but again he didn't seem to take a stand either with those who are proposing for indigenous African language to be used or those who are not. So, uh, Lucky, I don't know what you think should be uh, was his response in in that area. Or what would be your reaction? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Christie. Please, you can respond. Okay. Um, yeah, you are correct. He raised uh, a couple of questions. I think before the line where he raised the questions, he said for further research. Okay. So he recommended for further research, raising questions, which uh, I listed at the end of the, of the presentation. And one of those is um, how best when he asked, what is the future? Okay. What's the future like? He didn't give any outright, but he was saying that the voices of the women should be heard. Um, women are not crying, Mezurike. Women are not crying. Edet is a man, I guess. And uh, he also wants to emphasize that to enrich knowledge, knowledge production, that we really need to have a comprehensive perspective. Okay, so the narrative, the activities. So when he said, when he said the questions that we raise in African philosophy, what are the responses of African women philosophers to these questions. It's just as simple as that. So when we are compiling anthology, when we are writing ideas, ideas, ideas as it it's develops in African philosophy, there, might, there must be women who have responded to one question or the other. The problem is this masculine bias, this what, of course, what you call feminine problem, this uh, cognitive condition, because I'm using when I was reading it, I just saw that it's a cognitive condition, this masculine uh, ment uh, superiority mentality that is always uh, going around. And the fact that we keep reducing this problem to, oh, we should forget it uh, or reduce it to gender problem. That is the cognitive condition until we change that cognitive condition. Even now that we as Africans are fighting the Westerners, you know, for um, establishing for, for claiming to have an established methodology of reasoning, okay, or way of reasoning. And we are trying to tell them that it is not, it doesn't work that way. It, 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 it applies in the same context. So when we have a criteria of selecting authors, and when there is a criteria of selecting ideas or responses, what is what are those ideas? Can we, like, like we are discussing now, if we have anything against an idea, we present 
an argumentative approach to it. It's not just um, to push it under the ground because it is a woman. It is not, uh, um, it is not philosophical or critical to reject a, a, a text or, or even a response basically because we think that that person is just making noise. So I, I agree with you. He didn't provide, um, say, a concise and precise response, but he also provided what we could do in order to cover the gap. And of course, what he called enrichment of, of knowledge production within the discipline of philosophy in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lucky, please, very brief, please. We have okay, so many yeah. things up. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I would like to respond to the question by asking, uh, is the question of language in African philosophy an existential question that confronts the Africa today or the Africa we know? That's the question. And that was the concern of Mesembe instead of uh, the question of language. Although he started with the question of language, the, the essence of that is just to lay the foundation to where those conceptual decolonization. And that is why at the end, he, he just brushed it away. It's not, an, it's not a relevant question. It does not really address the existential problems in Africa. So for him, conceptual mandalization addresses African existential problems rather than decolonizing concepts that are found in language. So the language problem is not his problem if you read in between the lines. Thank you. Much. I will take the um, last three questions or comments, then I will call on the speakers to give in their um, answers or comments or contributions. Thank you. So, um, Alex, please unmute yourself and. Um, make your contribution or ask your question. X. Okay, um, while we are waiting for Alex, um, Pascal, can you unmute yourself and um, ask your question? Okay, thank you so much, madam. Uh, I have a question and I would like to go direct, uh, straight up to the point. Uh, my, my, my question is uh, about applying Mandela's, uh, uh, the concept of Mandelanization to issues in African philosophy. Uh, are, are there limits? Are there limits to what we can do uh, in regards to that? For instance, certain emerging concepts in uh, philosophy, uh, in African philosophy, a certain philosophical, emerging philosophical issues uh, where we do not directly have Mandela's take. Uh, for instance, he, he was a political icon. And uh, uh, so how do we apply his the concept of Mandelanization to emerging African concept, let, let's say in the African philosophy of medicine uh, or in uh, uh, artificial in intelligence and uh, emerging concepts like that. How do we? How can we so, uh, satisfactorily apply the concept of uh, conceptual Mandelanization to these concepts and make meaningful connection? Thank you. Thank you, Ofana. Please unmute yourself and ask your question or make your contribution. Thank you so much, Amara. Um, I, I'll just make a few comments. I won't take so much time. I think, um, like um, Christiana already said, um, we tend to overlook what the issue is in terms of um, gender issue. We tend to overlook the fact that uh, we do not um, do so much in contextualizing some of the issues that arises from my gender discourses. Hence, Muzuri um, Kazen comments, you know, some people become very complacent about the things that has to do with women, which is not right. Another thing is that <clears throat> having few conversations with some postgrad students when I was in Fort Hare, they have this idea that most of the men in uh, CSP, they have this masculine, um, I don't know, aura about them that they don't give space for the voices of women to be heard, which is not a good thing for a growing association. It's not like we want everybody 
but we should have uh, we should have this people should have this good understanding of what the CSP is all about out there. So I think sometimes when we make a comment, we should critically evaluate them before we throw out comments out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ofana. Alex, are you here now? Unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment. Alex? Okay, um, while we are still waiting for Alex, um, Dr. Christie, you can unmute yourself and give you a response. Thank you. Um, I think she didn't ask a question. She made a comment. Uh, so, of course, I stand with her on that on her comment. But a school of thought that is conver conversational and embracing all the three principles of conversation. Okay? So we should also manifest it even in the conversation that is taking place here. So conversational thinking is not a concept. It's not an idea. It's not an abstract idea. It's a way of life. It's a way of thinking is also a way of doing philosophy. And we are here on a, a philosophical a platform. We're also talking about ideas from different gender, different contexts. So let me remove the word gender. Let me even remove the word woman, but let me use the word context, which is one of the principles of conversation, all right? So that context means there is always an epistemic agent and there is always an epistemic context. So should we choose when we open our eyes and we see that the person who is in that epistemic context and who the epistemic agent is a man, does it make a difference when we open our eyes and see that the epistemic agent is a woman and the epistemic context is a woman? That is what Mesembet Edet is trying to point at, that when we listen to the context, the epistemic context of a man, the masculine epistemic context, that we should also listen to the feminine or the woman epistemic context for some reasons. And you understand, for us to have a clear understanding, I mean, we are talking about um, uh, conversation and the whole idea of uh, uh, Benoke or the, uh, you know, uh, conversation, what conversation is all about. So it's a struggle for meaning. Nobody is a, should be excluded in that struggle for meaning. And if we build an edifice, an epistemological edifice that we call African philosophy, it should be a struggle of meaning, of ideas, of meaning, of concepts, of meaning, of even African experience, okay? So, so that we'll be able to meet ourselves at least within the frame of what we can call conversation. And that is what Edith is trying to say, that if we need to have an enriched African philosophy built on authentic intellectual edifice, then we need to consider the epistemic agency of the, of the women. It's not about crying. It's not about asking for my rights. Okay? So it's about being and, and, and complementarity of being. Thank you. Much. I, I think the points you are trying to make cannot be overemphasized. There is a need for African philosophy to be all-inclusive. You know, let the voices be heard, whether it's coming from the male or from the female, let it be all inclusive. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Lucky, please unmute yourself and um, give your response. Yeah. I, I think the, 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 the point is that, uh, Anya, you need to know that uh, there is no limit to the application of a uh, conceptual mandalization in philosophizing or in doing African philosophy. Uh, I will refer you to the, the, the third principle. And the principle uh, holds that we need to interrogate uh, these contemporary issues uh, based on what Mandela would have done and what Mandela would have said if he was to be alive. That would become the yastic. And you should note that for Edit, Ma Mandela uh, was a humanist who was interested in promoting the interest and well-being of the human person. So whatever technological issues or contemporary issues you are addressing, uh, does it really lead, uh, will it also help us uh, better the lot of human, the human person? So that was really the cry of, uh, of Nelson Mandela and Edith says we should do philosophy in that light. Thank you. 
you so much for your response. Alex, are you still here with us? We can hear you, Alex. Okay, um, can you type in your question on the chat box? Okay, um, any final words? Unfortunately, we can hear Alex and unfortunately we cannot uh, take his question or his comment or his contribution, whichever one it is. Um, any final words from the speakers? Um, any final words from you, Dr. Christie? Of course, I have have uh, two minutes to because I didn't actually get into the criticism of the text. I just had to raise questions because uh, there are no time. Um, but uh, the point I want to make is the criticism of all the anthologies, all the compilations. Uh, what was the criteria? And it could also be that sometimes there will be call for papers, and most of the women don't respond, don't write. That could be also a problem. So we we can't neglect that. We can also neglect uh, that we that we are women doesn't mean that we won't produce quality papers. All right, but uh, the problem will be who judges the quality of the paper and what will be the criteria for the judging of the paper. Of course, peer reviewed uh, papers. Uh, you don't know who is who. Sometimes. Uh, it focuses on the content. So um, we also, as uh, African women, also need to um, um, improve, uh, do better. Uh, I'm not saying that there are no others. Like when I think of many whose names are not even listed in those articles I've known since I started my, my bachelor degree in Nigeria in philosophy, and many of them wrote quite uh, good works. So either they are not reachable or their articles are not available or nobody knows them or they are no more are no longer active or in the contemporary time, many of us are not contributing or writing or there might be several reasons for that. But like I said, if we are genuine and honest enough, we should also uh, search. It's part of research. Uh, it's called research. That means searching until we find to make our presentation, epistemic presentations, to make the knowledge we produce comprehensive and more dimensional. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chrissy. Dr. Lucky, any final words from you? Yeah, I, I think uh, Edith has really given us a cause to reflect on African philosophy beyond the usual. Uh, if you look at works on African philosophy, it's either we are concerned with the uh, philosophical issues that have been addressed and be labeled by Western philosophy, in Western philosophy by Western philosophers or other philosophic traditions. Uh, then secondly, it's either you're addressing uh, African existential issues, but uh, there's a new dimension to it. Why Mesembe agrees that we need to address African existential issues. He also have brought in something new. And what was that thing new? trying to address African existential issue using an African personage and the values pursued by that African person. So for him, for you to say you are decolonizing African philosophy and you are addressing a concept or you are addressing the problem of language or you're concerned with just mere philosophical issues that have been belabored, why not you focus on the African existential issue and then address it using an African person and his value. That is a new dimension. So we need really to pursue African philosophy and in particular African social political philosophy using this philosophical methodology propounded by Mesembe Edet. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers for your interesting thought provoking lectures. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Conversational School of Philosophy, CSP, for hosting this Tributes Roundtable um, for the late Professor Mesembe Edet. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for your questions, for your comments, for your contributions. Thank you. Without you, this event wouldn't have been a success. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Yeah, thank you, Amara. Thank you, Madoka, for well-organized discussion. And uh, Lucky, thank you also. Next time, leave yeah. my question for me to answer. <laughs> okay, I'm very, I'm very sorry. <laughs> yeah, I will lock you Thank up. you very much, Joe. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Amara. Thank, thank, thank you, Amara. Thank you, Amara. Thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you, Amara. 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 Thank you, Amara.